Hi, everybody. Guess what? We are doing an MS Views Now educational program, a virtual program, which began at the beginning of COVID. Actually, so at the beginning that it was just 30 days into the pandemic that we said we had to provide something for patients to be able to learn from with regard to, you know, COVID. All right. But then we transferred the program and we did a little bit more. I'll tell you about that in a few minutes. In the meantime, this program, again, is an MS Views Now program. My name is Stuart Schlossman, president and founder of MS Views and News. We are sponsored today by Biogen, Genentech, and Santa Fe, as you can see their names, and I want to give them a virtual round of applause. Thank you. Yay. All right. Next, we have Dr. Brian Steingo, and Dr. Brian Steingo is here today. He will be speaking about diet and nutrition for multiple sclerosis, and he will speak about that for about 20 minutes. And then he'll speak about COVID slash MS updates. And he'll be speaking about that for about 15 minutes. Okay, Dr. Steingo, he's the, um, he's the director of the Steward, S-T-E-W-A-R-D, um, MS Center in Sunrise, Florida. And he is a good doctor. He's great, he's well known in the South Florida area. He's smiling. He doesn't want to be that great, all right? But he's smiling. I can't believe I made him laugh. All right. And uh, he's going to speak to you now. All right, take it away, doctor. Uh, thank you, Stuart, for inviting me to do this. I hope I'm a good doctor, as, uh, as Stuart told you. So the first topic we're going to talk about is uh, MS and diet or uh, MS and uh, nutrition. And it's a controversial topic because there is no widespread consensus about this. Uh, there, there is evidence that... Um, Evidence that dietary factors uh, influence MS disease activity, uh, the course of MS, and the symptomatology. And uh, I've included below some, some of the evidence for whole grains, for fruits and vegetables, and that means whole fruits and vegetables, for unsaturated fatty acids, for legumes like beans, for nuts and seeds. And some of this evidence I'm going to discuss with you uh, tonight. And also, uh, there is evidence against eating red meat, dairy, sugar, or salt. In some situations, it doesn't mean you have to completely abandon something, but it means you have to uh, use it uh, in a limited way. Uh, what's the importance of MS and, uh, and nutrition is that we know that uh, in MS, that MS is uh, definitely have some genetic factors. And so people that develop MS, we suspect, are genetically predisposed to their MS. And then there are some other factors that may trigger off the MS. And so what we're doing when we're looking at diet is looking for modifiable risk factors. What can we change in our environment that is modifiable? Let me give you an example of other risk factors that we've come around and le learned about recently, such as Epstein-Barr virus. That's not a modifiable risk factor necessarily, although it may help us with treatment. But if we get Epstein-Barr, we can't modify that risk. But with diet, we have something we directly can control. And the purpose of changing on our diet is to influence the course of the MS, to reduce the inflammation, because the early stages of MS are associated with inflammation, and then to protect, protect against neurodegeneration and to promote repair. So these are the, this is the three-pronged attack we have against MS to influence the disease course, reduce inflammation, uh, protect against neurodegeneration and promote repair. How does the diet affect the uh, course of MS? Well, the first thing is that there could be an indirect effect. If you change your diet in a certain way, you could improve metabolic outcomes. For example, if someone has high cholesterol, high body weight, history of all the risk factors for metabolic disease, hypertension, diabetes, uh, and then we change our diet, we haven't improved, we've improved the metabolic factors, and by improving the metabolic factors, we have a benefit for MS too. It is known that people with MS have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease than the general neurological or, or population. So the first effect of diet is the indirect effect by effect, affecting other conditions. And then too, diet may have a direct effect a direct effect of dietary substances or dietary metabolites, which is the breakdown of dietary substances, or may have an effect too on the gut microbiota. 
and you have probably heard of the term the microbiome and the microbiome is a term for all the trillions of bacteria that live together with us in our body mostly in the gastrointestinal tract and also uh, on the skin and these bacteria in fact can produce substances that are useful to us so that is another way that diet can interact so there are many ways that our diet and dietary changes may have an effect uh, on the course of ms and some of these products produced in the gastrointestinal tract may in fact have an effect uh, on the immune system next please now there have been many diets and i thought i would spend a few minutes uh, going over some of these diets that people read about all the time. Now, I put these two on this page together, the Walsh Protocol and the McDougall Diet, because they do have something in common. When these diets were studied, both of them had a positive effect uh, on MS fatigue. In both diets, the people in the studies improved their fatigue. Both of these diets eliminated dairy, and they encouraged colorful fruits and vegetables and they avoided processed foods. So these are important similarities. Avoiding dairy, encouraging colorful fruits and vegetables and avoiding processed foods. But they differ now. The Walsh Protocol eliminates starches, wheat, grains, legumes, and dairy. But it favors grass-fed meats, wild fish, some organ meats, leafy greens, and pigmented foods. So this diet is not a vegetarian diet. There is fish and meat that is a component of it. The McDougall diet, on the other hand, is more of a vegan diet. There is no meat or dairy, and again, no processed foods. And it favors beans, corn, rice, sweet potatoes, things that we ate many, many years ago. So these are two common diets. The similarities, as I, as I described, and also uh, the differences between these two common diets. Next, please. Can I advance it? Now, I have put up for you over here uh, the Swank diet. Uh, this was probably the father of all MS diets. Roy Swank started the initial studies in the early 1950s with just a small number of patients. Uh, that were put on a very low-fat diet. His theory was that people with MS should have a low-fat diet and certainly avoid saturated fats. The results of his initial study on a small number of people were very promising. So he expanded the study and had 144 people. And some of these people were followed until 1990. So this is a very long study. And it was published in a reputable journal, The Lancet, in 1990. And the conclusion was that 95% of the people who had a low fat diet, meaning 20 or fewer grams of saturated fat a day, did not experience progression of the MS. Uh, of great interest was that after 34 years on this study, they had a death rate of 31% compared to the group following a more typical diet, which the death rate was 80%. In other words, the people that followed the low fat diet had a much lower death rate and less progression than the people who continue to eat a regular diet. Now, this diet can be criticized. It's very long, uh, and there are differences that cannot be accounted for. Do people do other things? Do they have other diseases? Uh, something else is that maybe the people that stayed on the low-fat diet had specific characteristics, and those that took the regular diet did not. So this is not a very well-controlled diet, which is uh, why it receives a lot of criticism. But still, there's some interesting things that come out of it that if we stayed on the low-fat diet as advocated by Swank uh, 70 years ago, that there did seem some better outcomes. Another diet that you've heard about is the paleo diet. What's this diet? This is the diet where we eat food that could be obtained by the hunters and gatherers of thousands of years ago. So it does include lean meats, fish, fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds. So you'll see similarity to the Walls diet. So it limits foods to the foods that were present in the hunter-gatherer days, more so than when there was commercialized uh, farming. So for example, it includes dairy products, legumes, and grains, 
but it avoids salt, it avoids sugars, it avoids processed foods. So in all these diets, we've seen that the one thing that they all, every one of these diets are greens on uh, is processed foods. Now, this is another diet that has been somewhat popular in recent years, and that's the keto diet. Now, this diet is a diet that is very low in carbohydrates, and it is high in fats and moderate in proteins. As you see in the breakdown that I've included here, that most of this diet is fat, up to 60%, about one third protein, and only five to 10% carbs. So the total amount of carbs in a typical day is only 20 to 50 grams per day. Now, what does this diet mimic? This diet almost mimics a fasting state. When a person fasts or has low carbs, their energy is derived from sources other than the glucose. If there is no glucose in our diet or less glucose, we have to obtain energy from other sources. And this is obtained from fat. And this produces ketone bodies. And that is why we call this a keto diet or we are in a state of ketosis. So the body is breaking down fat that is stored into these substances called ketones. You burn fat to produce energy instead of sugar. Because if we burn too much sugar, then we know, especially on diets that are what we call high glycemic diets, a high glycemic diet is a diet that has refined carbohydrates. And a low glycemic diet has complex carbohydrates. And a high, di high glycemic uh, diet leads to uh, weight gain and increased eating. So this diet is mimicking a fasting state the keto diet, mimicking a fasting state, low carbohydrate, high fat diet. So this is another common diet you'll read about. Now that we've been over several different types of diets that are out there, let's talk about fats. And we are talking here about saturated fats or unsaturated fats. Uh, we are saying that we want to avoid saturated fats. So these saturated fats are found in processed foods and they can, they can promote, they can stimulate pro-inflammatory T cells. We don't want pro-inflammatory T cells. We want anti-inflammatory T cells. Short-chain fatty acids, on the other hand, will lead to production of anti-inflammatory T cells. So we definitely don't want long-chain fatty acids and want to encourage short-chain fatty acids. Below, you will see a polyunsaturated fatty acid so omega-3 fatty acids are polyunsaturated fatty acids. They are found in fish, walnuts, and flaxseed. And then you see uh, monounsaturated fatty acids, which are found in olive oils, avocados, and certain nuts, and are a big part of the Mediterranean diet. Or another diet you've heard of, the Mediterranean diet, containing many monounsaturated fatty acids and olive oils, avocados, and certain nuts. Now, there is some evidence that omega-3 fatty acids Omega-3 fatty acids may, in fact, uh, have some benefit on MS. There have been studies in which have shown that uh, omega-3 fatty acids obtained from plant sources or marine sources are of benefit. In an Australian study, it seemed that the marine sources were more beneficial than the plant sources of omega-3. So the summary of that slide is we want to have unsaturated fatty acids, and these can come from various sources, plants or fish. Moving on from fats now, we're going to talk about dairy. And there was a very large study done, the nurse's health study, which essentially concentrated on the effects of diet on women. Most patients in the study in those days were women. And the finding of this study was that the nurses who consumed three or more servings of whole milk a day in adolescence as teens were 47% more likely to develop MS in life than those who did not. In other words, consuming a lot of milk uh, led to a higher incidence of MS. Some people have debated this. That was the nurse's health study. Now there is another study you read over here called the holism study. And that's a study measuring health outcomes in MS patients. And in this particular study of over 2,000 patients, uh, the people who reported not consuming dairy were less likely to report recent disease activity and a higher health-related quality of life. So this is a second study on dairy, and the third one, a more recent, this is actually a very recent study published from the University of Bonn, 
And they said that there's a protein in cow's milk, it's called casein, uh, that is similar to some of the amino acids that compose myelin. And if the body reacts to this protein in cow's milk, it can go wrong and it can attack the myelin component. So when they studied this in mouse, in mice, they found that there was that there was a cross reactivity and that if there was an allergy to cow's milk, it could attack the myelin as well. And they therefore felt that certain groups of sufferers, people that have certain allergies to milk, should avoid dairy products. They, uh, they thought that in areas of the world where there was high drinking of cow's milk, there was a higher incidence of MS. So this is some of the evidence for, for dairy, but there have been some studies that shown that you know, the effects are not like this. However, I think these are three good studies showing that dairy, in fact, is something to be minimized or avoided. Now, I've talked about all the different components. Try and put them together. We talked about a variety of different diets that you could pick, uh, such as the Walls diet, the Swank diet, the Keto diet, the Paleo diet. We referred briefly to the Mediterranean diet, the McDougall diet, a whole lot, bunch of diets. Some of the components of the diets we spoke about. But clearly, in the short space of time, we can't go into great detail about all of them, but we spoke about fats and dairy. And now, in the final few minutes of this section, uh, I'm going to try and put uh, all these together for you. Uh, and the first uh, slide that I have put up here is a slide uh, on what I call uh, defensive dining. Just like defensive driving is to protect you, and so is defensive dining. And so the first thing we know is about calorie and content control. We've spoken for the last uh, few minutes on the content. We also know that calorie control may be important. And there are some diets that are calorie, calorie restriction diets or fasting diets. And the keto diet, as I mentioned, almost mimics those. And we know that if people go on these calorie restrictive diets or fasting mimicking diets, that, that that is a way of losing weight. There's no doubt that people that are on those diets do lose some weight. How else do we control our portions is by sharing, by having smaller portions. And here I'm referring um, to sharing in two ways. One way is to share with other people. We know most places you go, if you buy a plate, you can probably share it with two of you. But in addition, you could share with yourself, meaning I would say that if you get a plate of food, you divide it into two portions. And when the food arrives, maybe get the uh, doggy bag or box right away and pack half of it away. And then you just leave half on the plate. And so you're sharing it with yourself. And eating slower goes with that too. So if you're able to eat a smaller portion and slowly, that definitely helps in losing weight. That is because if we eat too fast, our brains do not recognize how much we've consumed and they, we still may feel hungry. And by the time our brain recognizes what we've consumed, we've consumed too much. So eating a smaller portion and slowly is a way of losing weight. That is a form of calorie and content control. What you eat, sharing it, eating it slower. And then the salad dressing is important too, not to pour it on the plate and also to have a salad dressing. And we've been stressing in some of these diets to have a low fat diet. So a low fat dressing in moderation. And don't forget when you're out that calories, alcohol has calories. So we want to control alcohol calories as well. The next item on this page is obesity, and that's the result of everything we've spoken about beforehand, that if we follow these diets and don't control our fat intake or our refined carbohydrate intake, the net result is obesity. I mentioned to you that the nurses' health study showed that nurses that drank a lot of milk in adolescence had a more progression of their MS. But we know that adolescence and teenagers is a risk factor or MS. And so that's one of the examples of how this ties in. So we want to control weight from a young age. Uh, also avoid salt. There are studies on salt. Most of them said to avoid salt. It also goes to some of the comorbidities that we might have. For example, hypertension and other metabolic diseases. We should minimize our salt intake. Further on this slide, you see sugar and saturated fats. I won't go into the saturated fats in more detail. We've discussed quite a bit of that. But we know with sugar that if a diet contains sugar, 
that is refined carbohydrate. And it is carbohydrate that if we eat, it stimulates insulin. And when we stimulate the insulin, because this is absorbed, these refined carbohydrates are absorbed very quickly. And so they stimulate insulin, which then makes us be, have, drop our blood sugar and become hypoglycemic. And we are hungry and we snack and we eat more. So refined carbohydrates like sugar, no good. Complex carbohydrates, on the other hand, are absorbed slowly. So we want foods that are absorbed slowly. And then finally, we want to, to some degree, limit red meat and dairy. And there are studies, uh, the dairy we've spoken about and the red meat, I think lots of studies have shown that red meat should be limited, also has uh, metabolic consequences. I wanted to end off the section on diet, uh, talking a little bit about the uh, MS and the microbiome. And this is a, a summary from Dr. Howard Weiner, who uh, is a leading researcher in MS in uh, Boston. And he said that the gut will be the next frontier in MS therapy. And you may have heard us speak about the gut-brain axis. And what he's saying is how we eat and what we eat uh, influences the kind of bacteria living in our gastrointestinal tract, and in turn, that influences the immune system. Because a very large part of the immune system is actually in the gut. And in the gut, we find different types of bacteria. And the bacteria found in the gut of MS patients may be different from that found in control. In other words, there are bacteria that may drive inflammation and bacteria that may reduce inflammation. So can we in fact control our disease to some extent by changing our diet, by using maybe less antibiotics than by using probiotics? So this is the microbiome becoming a subject of great interest uh, in MS. Next, please. Uh, this was something uh, from the Cleveland Heart Lab. This, and the Cleveland Heart Lab developed a test for a substance, a compound called TMAO, trimethylamine oxide. So trimethylamine oxide is a dietary metabolite produced by the gut bacteria associated with cardiovascular disease. So when we eat meat or carnitine, it is broken down by the gut bacteria and produces TMAO. And TMAO has a link to a higher incidence of heart disease. So substances rich in red meat and dairy, broken down by the gut bacteria, produce TMAO. This test can actually be uh, undertaken by the Cleveland Clinic. Next, please. And uh, so, to summarize, a large part of the immune, human immune system resides in the gastrointestinal tract, a very large part of it. In the microbiome or the microbiota, there are trillions of bacteria, and they all live together. We help them, we give them a home, they help us. They do a variety of metabolic activities. But we give them food and they do metabolic activities. They metabolize the dietary substances that we eat, and they actually even can produce some dietary substances uh, that we rely on. And so if they are out of balance, it's not surprising that they may, this may lead to illnesses. And the microbiome has not only been studied in MS, but it is studied in a lot of gastrointestinal diseases like Crohn's disease and also in other neurological diseases like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. Uh, there are large studies going on with the uh, microbiome. That concludes the section on diet. I wanted to tell you about, review briefly some of the diets available, some of the dietary substances, and try and put it all together for you in things that you should think about what to eat and what to avoid, especially avoiding always processed foods. Now, part two is that Stuart asked me to do uh, a little update on COVID. Uh, this topic is in the news everywhere. And so I just, uh, after discussion, wanted to show you a few items. And 
The land of MS, you know, you know, is my favorite topic, and I wanted to show you where COVID-19 comes into the land of MS. Anytime uh, that anytime that we are talking about MS, all these topics, as you know, we could pick each one and have an evening about it. But if you look at the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see the section that I talked about called general health, and that is that the general your general health is clearly very important in maintaining your MS health. And uh, in the general health section, I added in COVID-19 to that section. And um, in the past, I've always talked about the health bank, but now we're also talking about COVID-19. What do we know about it? Uh, a little update on it and a little, a little talk at the end on long COVID. We know that infections in general may result in new MS symptoms or MRI activity. We know that fever can cause a temporary worsening of symptoms. Therefore, it is possible uh, COVID-19 can trigger an MS relapse. It's an infection or you may have fever, you can trigger an MS relapse. Uh, the severity of the COVID infection has been studied in several MS registries. So right at the bottom of this page, you see I refer to that many of you may know of covms.org. This is a big registry, uh, which is no longer fully subscribed to. In other words, people don't enter uh, new uh, cases. But they have over 4,000 cases in the MS registry, and we know that in patients with MS, that a large part of how they, the outcome is related to their comorbidities. So do they have cardiovascular disease, pulmonary disease, kidney disease, diabetes, hypertension, cancer, or obesity? Any of those risk factors in a general population result in a worsening of COVID outcomes. And so similarly, in the MS population, if an MS patient has any of those comorbidities, there is a worsening of outcomes. But there is one other factor in the MS, and that is the severity of the MS. Uh, patients who are more disabled uh, in terms of their uh, mobility or MS in general, maybe patients bedridden or walk wheelchair dependent, those patients did have worse outcomes than patients that have milder MS. So we need to manage those more carefully and have good behavioral uh, aspects in those people. So these are some of the factors we know about COVID as it relates uh, to MS. So here's recommendations that we put forward. Get vaccinated and boosted according to the guidelines. Now this is widely recommended by all the MS organizations in the world and by the great majority of uh, MS neurologists. That if someone is vaccinated and boosted, they're going to have better outcomes. When taking MS medications, on most medications, we do not recommend a delay in starting. And if someone's on the medication, no adjustment is recommended. So for the majority of the medications, we don't recommend any adjustment during this period of COVID or in relation to vaccinations. Now there is a group of drugs that we call the B cell depleters. That is because the way they work is to reduce the B cells in our blood. And the examples that we've used for MS are Ocrevus and Rituxan. If these drugs uh, are uh, in action, there are no B cells, our antibody production is limited. Therefore, we recommend getting fully vaccinated several weeks prior to starting the infusion. Or if someone is already on these medications, wait at least three months or so until they get vaccinated. So typically when you're vaccinated, we want you to wait a few weeks till you start the medication. Uh, on the next line, I put there Mavenclad S1P drugs and Kesimta. And again, we recommend getting vaccinated uh, before you start these. But then in terms of uh, timing, this is something that should be discussed individually. Maybe after you start the drugs or you're on the drugs, you wait a few weeks and then you proceed with them with the vaccinations. Finally, the third bullet point, the third point, is always to be aware of community resources, what's available in our community, where do we get vaccines, where do we get tested, and you'll see in the forthcoming slide other things that we need to know about the community, and to have a balance. Let's have a balance between normalization with caution about high-risk behaviors. So we want to get as normal as possible, but at the same time balance it with high-risk behaviors. So balance is always uh, what we're striving for.
So currently, as we're all aware, the Omicron variant is dominant, but there is a new variant. BA2 is on the rise now, and BA2 is replacing BA1. Overall, Omicron seems to be a milder illness than Delta. Vaccine actually is less effective against Omicron, and some of the some of the drugs that we use to treat Delta, in fact, don't, are not as effective for Omicron. So there are some differences, but overall, it is a milder illness. Uh, we do anticipate more variants are likely to emerge. You will hear people sometimes comparing Omicron to the common cold. Uh, this I would not agree with. Yes, if you have some immunity, you've been vaccinated, you've had COVID and you're healthy, yes, maybe you can compare it. But if you're not vaccinated and in a vulnerable group, we still have to practice good behavior because it's not the common cold. Now, of some interest is that new vaccines are under development, including a universal coronavirus vaccine. That will work against all strains of coronavirus, not only SARS, which is COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 is COVID-19. It would not only work against that, but other coronaviruses such as MERS or such as the common cold. This is under development. Remember that although COVID-19 is a disease that is seen primarily to affect the lungs, it can affect many other organs in the body, including the brain, the heart, and the kidneys. I wanted to talk about Evusheld, and that went partially to what I said on the prior slide about knowing what's available in the community. Now, this is the only drug that is approved by the FDA as emergency use for prevention of COVID-19. So this is a drug we take to prevent COVID-19, and it is made of two antiviral drugs that I've put their names in here because they would be hard to remember, but they are Tixa. Give them app or something like that. Co-package with Sulcavimab or something like that. You'll see these drugs in the word MAB, and that stands for a monoclonal antibody, and we know that because many of our MS drugs now are monoclonal antibodies. So this is approved by the FDA in some individuals to prevent COVID-19. This is not for everybody to prevent COVID-19, nor is it to be given after someone it's COVID-19. This works in people that cannot mount an adequate response. So this is people that are on chemotherapy with cancer, with malignancies, with transplants, with HIV, people that have weak immune systems. But there are certain MS drugs where this drug, where this uh, Evusheld could be considered, especially the B-cell depleting drugs that are listed on the next line is the anti-CD20 drugs. And potentially, if you take some other drugs like S1P drugs, where you can't mount a strong response, you could consider Evusheld. Let me just add that on the S1P receptor drugs, which includes Fingolimod or Jelenia, Mazent, Saposia, and Ponvori, that people have not had worse outcomes than the general MS population on those drugs. Pregnant mothers might be another group under consideration. If a pregnant mother is given this drug, because we know pregnancies may be may have a worse outcome with COVID. And even if this medication crossed the placenta, it will not have effect on the fetus because it's not self-directed. It's not directed against the human target, but rather against the virus. Now, finally, why shouldn't everyone take this? And if you look at the bottom, there are some warnings. Hypersensitive reaction can occur. Immune reactions, allergic reactions can occur to everything. There have been some cardiovascular side effects, including heart attacks. People with a bleeding history shouldn't take it. And the most common side effects that we've seen with this are headaches, cough, and fatigue. The people that got the cardiovascular disorders, most of those already had cardiovascular disease, so that might be an individual that we should not consider giving this medication. What are the health footprints of COVID-19? Uh, the first wave. What's the first wave? Immediate morbidity and mortality, sickness and death directly from the virus. The second wave, that this overwhelms our health systems and the impact of, res of resource restrictions, urgent non-COVID conditions were, uh, were neglected, heart attacks, pneumonia, other conditions that people had, afraid to go to the hospital, couldn't get into a hospital. The third wave, 
impact of the interruptive care on chronic conditions, people with chronic conditions like MS having difficulty finding care. And finally, what are the long-term effect, mental stress, economic impact, and burnout? So these are four uh, significant footprints of COVID that we should be aware of. Next, please. okay, long COVID. I want to talk a little bit about long COVID. Different definitions of long COVID. Uh, so how is the definition of the CDC? That is the one I've included here, the CDC definition. The World Health Organization has a different definition. But the CDC says it's a wide range of new, returning, or ongoing health problems people may experience more than four weeks after being first affected with SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. Some factors that we know, what may contribute to this? The first is that there could be direct cell damage, which may then be lingering or ongoing. Direct cell damage because of the virus entering and destroying the cell, and maybe a large part of the organ, will lead to long-term symptoms. Secondly, some patients have chronic hospitalization or chronic illness, bed-bound for weeks. We know what this does in other conditions, not COVID, other conditions where people may be bed-bound. Weakness, cognitive dysfunction, psychosocial stress, confusion. These happen with all forms of chronic hospitalization. And then what about after the acute recovery? There can be viral persistence. What does that mean? That we find that the virus is located in many organs in the body, other than the typical organs like the lungs and other organs like the esophagus and the kidneys, we find a virus. And then a very important point, 3B, immune persistence, that there is something wrong with the immune system, that this virus has done something to the immune system, that there is dysregulation of the immune system. There's no longer functioning properly and leads to some of the other conditions that we see in terms of long COVID. I put here some of the symptoms of long COVID, and you can see there are many of them. They're widespread. Loss of smell, loss of taste, fatigue, weakness, shortness of breath, coughing, pain, sleep problems, difficulty concentrating and memory problems, headache, depression or anxiety and dizziness. Of course, you see some overlap here with some MS symptoms that people could have. So fatigue, weakness, Difficulty concentrating, memory problems, dizziness. There's overlap between these symptoms and what an MS person might experience. And then how do we differentiate? Is this an MS uh, development or is this from long COVID? There were some interesting factors that were found to be associated with a higher risk of long COVID. The first was female gender. So we don't know why this is. Some people said because females are better patients. They report more of their symptoms. The male is uh, reluctant. But I think it's been shown that it does seem that long COVID may affect females more than males. Older age and active smoking. But in this study, they thought the severity of the disease didn't have a role in long COVID. That's kind of uh, contradictory because some people have said that the worst initial disease, of course, if there's more damage early on, we're going to have more long-term symptoms. I think this is the final slide, and that is, I found this support group, I don't know if anybody has experience with this to comment on it. It looked very good when I looked it up on the internet, and I put the, uh, at the bottom over there, I put the link survivorcore.com. It seemed to be an organization in America uh, to try and help people understand COVID and deal with COVID, and um, was recognized by uh, various important government organizations as being a valid organization. So I thought this was just a support group that people might find uh, good information uh, on COVID. In addition to all the usual MS resources, of course, we thank Stuart for constantly pu publishing information on MS views and news. And then the other organizations like the MS Society also give us information. So we have a lot of sources to uh, look up information. And I think that concludes uh, the slides. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Steingo. Round of applause to you. Again, an awesome doctor. Okay, smile again. There you go. <laughs> Great. All right, so we got a lot of people online, and um, and I'm really glad to see this. I don't know if it's about the nutritional and, and diet aspect. I don't know if it's about COVID, but in either case, I'm glad everybody is here to, to listen in on everything. Um, we do have a lot of questions that came in in advance. I'm glad that too many others did not write questions, although they did. And so I do want to begin first, though, with um, I can't say that any one is more important than the other. 
but I'm going to begin first with the questions on diet and nutrition. And before I start getting into all of them, though, doctor, I have a question for you, and that is that, um, you know, lots of people, there. you spoke about a lot of the different diets. Okay, great. But when a patient of yours comes into your office and they say, doc, I need to know what's the best diet that you think that I should be on, what would be your recommendation? So uh, the first thing that I do is I tell them, this is me now, so I'm personal me. I tell them to open a, I tell them to open a bank account, right? It's called the health bank. So I ask them, they never know where I'm heading. I say, do you have a bank account? Why? You're saving for your future. And so I want you now to open your health bank for your future health. For example, there would be the SS bank account that one Stuart Schlossman knows about. You open your own bank account where you start to do healthy things to enter into your bank account. And diet is one of them. Exercise is another one, for example. But now let's talk about the diet. What I tell them about the diet is essentially everything we've been over. So what do I tell them? Avoid processed foods. That's what I tell them. And then I say, I would like you to have a plant-based diet. Now, that doesn't mean I want you to be a vegan. I want you to be plant-based. That A large part of your diet, maybe 80% of it is plants, healthy plants, all the multicolored vegetables that we can eat and fruits, unprocessed fruits and vegetables, not processed fruits and vegetables, not a fruit or a vegetable that's in a capsule, but a fruit and vegetable as, as God made it. So pro no processed food, eat fruits and vegetables, legumes, seeds, and nuts. Avoid processed foods, limit red meat, limit dairy, no added salt, no added sugar. And that's what I recommend. A very good site that I do recommend people to read is some, a book called The Blue Zones. And to go online and look up The Blue Zones that talks about plant-based eating, but not in a fanatic way, that allows you to have meat and other animal products in a limited way. So that's a very good site. So that's a summary of how I approach the diet in my practice. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Next, um, a person writes, do MS meds possibly contribute to difficulty losing weight in spite of exercising better eating habits? Um, boy, sorry, can you repeat that one? Do MS medications possibly oh. contribute to difficulty losing weight in spite of exercising or better eating habits? No, I think if you look up medications, they say, they we see that they often say both things. They'll tell you a medication, for example, might increase weight or lose weight. So for the most part, uh, the MS medications are weight neutral. What does happen is that people with MS often take other drugs that can affect their weight. For example, antidepressants. Often people that may take an antidepressant may gain weight. So a lot of other drugs that we use for MS can affect their weight, but the MS drugs typically uh, don't cause big weight changes. You will find people that will say they'll take a particular drug and they lost 10 pounds, and I've seen that, and then the next person tells me they gained five pounds on it. So I think there's a lot of variables, and in general, they seem to be neutral. A lot of the other drugs can affect the weight as well. Okay, thank you for that. Next, a person is writing, what is a typical daily menu, including snacks and beverage intake? Should meals be made with more anti-inflammatory foods than protein? And which food category is best to combat, combat MS fatigue? I think everything that I summarized is a very, obviously it's a very broad question. And right. I think that the, di the, the diet that we are recommending, and again, is a diet to avoid processed foods and to have a balanced, a balanced diet. Uh, a very good source of that is the blue zones. And the Blue Zones has many, besides the fact that someone can register for it and read about all these diets, the Blue Zones also contains information on exercise, wellness, mindfulness, uh, kindness, things like that, other things that are very important. But in terms of the diet, I think we want to tell people to avoid processed foods and avoid dairy. So, for example, you could start a diet with, with a good meal of some berries and some, and some yogurt. I would have myself yogurt that is dairy-free yogurt, almond yogurt, uh, berries, oatmeal, would be a good balanced diet. Uh, meat, fish, chicken, all of those in limited uh, amounts. And between a combination of all of those, lots of fruits and vegetables, I would find a balanced diet for the day. Okay, thank you. You know, you brought up uh, almond yogurt. If a person has almond allergies, what is a good substitute for that? Um, you know, they have different kinds of yogurt. You have soy yogurt, 
Uh, you also can have um, coconut milk. You can have oat milk. So there's many options besides almonds. I think a lot of people these days are liking oh, telling me about oat milk, but there's soy milk and there's other types too. Okay, thank you for that. Next question, is the WALS protocol scientifically robust? And what does the neurology MS community think of this diet? I think the very, very first sentence um, that I said tonight uh, on diet answers that question in part. It says, there is no consensus. So best I'm gonna do is tell you what my view on this is, and other people may give you a different view and that is that I personally do not like the Walls diet. Um, I, I like parts of it, just as I like parts of the McDougall diet. And the parts I like is that there is no processed foods and there's lots of green, leafy, and colored vegetables that are recommended. I like that part of it, which is also part of the McDougall diet and other diets. What I do not like in that diet is that it promotes uh, meats. Even though it says lean meats, it promotes meats and it promotes organ meats. And that is something that, um, for no good scientific reason, maybe, maybe it's psychological, but uh, I don't, uh, you know, favor eating organ meats necessarily. Um, so that's the part of that diet. It's not a scientifically validated diet. It started out with Dr. Walls. There has been a study, I've quoted the study. There was a study with the Walls diet and the McDougall diet where both of them were shown to help fatigue. That is a published study. That if you took the Walls diet or the McDougall diet, they were two different diets and they showed they both helped fatigue. But there was no strong evidence that either one of them necessarily changed the course of the MS. Okay, thank you. So I'm reading questions that people asked when they registered. But if anybody that's online right now have any questions, please type it in and we will definitely get to those as well. For instance, right now I'm going to take an online question for you. And that is, does fermented dairy like yogurt have the same negative effect as... as I got to get to the rest of it, as milk, cream, and butter. I'm going to talk about um, fer fermentation in a specific way. And um, I mean, fermentation, fried, cured, preserved, all of those things somewhat. Something, something is being done to adjust the meals in some ways. And so the way that the fermentation pro process is done is what's important. So if slow ferment, like, let me give you an example of fermentation in something that's very, very, very easy to understand is bread. So if you look at sourdough bread, that is uh, that you start with a starter and it's very slowly fermented, as opposed to some of our modern day white bread that is fermented in a very rapid way. What happens in, is that in bread that is fermented or any product that's fermented rapidly, the glucose is rapidly available. There is with minimal digestion, if the glucose is rapidly available, it gets into the bloodstream very quickly. It stimulates insulin production and leads to that whole sequence I spoke to you about before uh, with insulin. And what that does is once insulin is out there, you become hypoglycemic, you stack more, you eat more, you gain weight. Whereas in the foods such as complex carbohydrates that are slowly digested, the sugar is released much more slowly. So the fermentation process itself is not a bad word, but slow fermentation is good and fast fermentation is not good. Okay, thank you for that. Next, um, we have, um, are anti-inflammatory diets important to help treat inflammatory autoimmune diseases? So as you know, I strongly believe in that. And anti-inflammatory diet is essentially what we've discussed tonight. So when we set an anti-inflammatory diet, we set a diet that includes things I've said, a plant-based diet with uh, legumes, nuts, fruits, vegetables, whole fruits, whole vegetables, seeds and nuts, and avoiding processed foods. The, the biggest culprit for inflammation is processed foods. So we need to avoid processed foods. Processed foods also uh, rapidly uh, have a high glycemic index, meaning the glucose is rapidly released and insulin is produced, the same as foods that are slow cooked fermented, have a high glycemic incidence, uh, usually foods that are rapidly fermented instead of slow fermented. So high, that's what I mean. A plant-based diet is an anti-inflammatory diet. Now that includes uh, also, uh, you can also get sources, for example, omega-3 fatty acids. You can get that from marine sources, fish, cold water fish, omega-3 fatty acids. A bunch of those, three or several of those, also anti-inflammatory. 
So that's why I said that the diet, a good diet like we talk about, maybe a diet that's 80% plant-based, but you also have a pescatarian diet where you eat some fish, especially cold water fish, salmon, cod, halibut, will give you a very good source of omega-3 fatty acids. And in fact, some studies showed that the omega-3 fatty acids that come from fish are better than those that come from plants. I don't know. But a good balanced diet is to have the majority of the diet plant-based, but also to have a good source of cold water fish. Great. Thank you for that. Now, you just brought up about plant-based uh, foods. So let me ask you this. If somebody would do a moderate plant-based diet, how would they start their day? And what would they have for lunch and for dinner? What are your recommendations on that? I mean, berries. Berries is always a good start. It's always good to have some berries. So berries with, as I said, my diet, berries in the morning, uh, oftentimes with the almond-based yogurt, sometimes uh, not with almond-based yogurt, sometimes uh, oak, oak, oak or soy. Well, the oat milk, I know there's, always, oh, there's certainly soy yogurt. So that would be the diet, a, a full bowl of berries with the, with the yogurt. And then later on, for meals later in the day, uh, salads, for example. Now, nowadays, it's easier to have some other diets. Um, there's a much larger selection available now for a vegetarian diet. You can have uh, commercial products like Beyond Burger, Impossible Burger, Impossible Sausage, things like that that are uh, plant-based products, so those can add to some extra meals as well. Um, you, you can get um, plant-based pastas. So a combination of all of those, I think, is uh, is, is what, what I do. Okay, great. Thank you now for the, that. The blue zones, again, to go to the blue zones, I'm not a dietary expert of note. Let me say that when people are saying, what are the things that I have? I'm, I'm a spoiled, lucky person. I'm well-fed. I have an excellent chef, namely my wife who uh, is very good in the kitchen, and as bad as I am, she's good. So I'm, you know, so do research, in other words, and we have books, we have the Blue Zones as an excellent source to start with. Okay, thank you. One topic, I just want for five seconds to add one topic that I didn't talk about purposely in a way, is gluten, a very controversial dietary topic. But gluten has been written about by uh, Dr. David Perlmutter in his book, Brain Grain, and he attributes everything to gluten excess. And I think the modification of our diet in processed foods has definitely exposed us to more gluten as well. When you stay away from more processed foods, you also reduce gluten. So uh, there are other sources of, of diets, such as brain grain and books like that that have been written on, on the diets. Dr. Wall's book has stuff on, on diets. Uh, if you go to the Sw uh, Swank website, it's got a lot of diets. So there are lots of sources where people can look for recipes and meals. Okay, thank you. So are there any specific uh, diets that people should stay away from if they're using a drug such as rituximab? No, the only, of all the MS medications, uh, the one that we have cautioned people about, of course, is alemtuzumab, which was Lemtrada, because that is a powerful suppressor of the immune system. And when people initially take it for the first few weeks or months, their immune system is quite suppressed. So we tell them to stay away from all raw foods. They should have no raw foods. In fact, we put them on a diet similar to a chemo diet. No raw foods, no uncooked foods, and no unpasteurized milk. That might sound strange in our country, but in some areas, unpasteurized milk is available. So we tell them to avoid all those things which can be a source of bacteria, like listeria or salmonella. So we say avoid all raw or uncooked foods. But for the other MS drugs, uh, the, the immune systems are not totally suppressed as with Adam Tuzumab uh, for the early period, and uh, we have no specific dietary restriction. Okay, thank you. All right, next, uh, probiotics. What do you recommend? Um, yes, there are probiotics that can be taken. Uh, always get a good source of probiotics. I mean, the, th the fact is that there are literally millions of different bacteria. So um, I think people should just take a good, well-recommended uh, probiotic and, and uh, I, I would have no objection to them. I think that a probiotic is good. There is more and more talk uh, of prebiotics, which are a step ahead of that, taken a step earlier than say a probiotic, uh, also to modify the bacteria. All of these things are modifying bacteria. I think in five or 10 years time, when we recommend for you medications, we may be recommending specific probiotics because many studies in the microbiome have shown many different bacteria that could be involved. 
you know, lactobacillus, bifidobacteria, many different bacteria. We don't know exactly which the right ones are. So if you said to me which one to take, I could say to you, you know, we don't have the right answer. Each one of them has different bacteria. Let's just take one that's got a lot of bacteria, over maybe 100 million bacteria, and take a, a good, well-recommended brand from a reliable source. Right. Yes or no, should dairy and gluten be eliminated with MS? Um, yes from and no. Think? Yes, mine says yes and no. Yes and no. <laughs> okay. So yes, yes no. so yes, so, so yes to dairy. I do think people should have should elim largely eliminate dairy, and that was something that's very to me. I am quite passionate about eliminating as much dairy as possible, which is why right. I spend some time on it. Uh, in terms of gluten, there are certain people that are gluten sensitive. They have celiac disease, and they clearly should eliminate gluten. Uh, other than that, if we go to cert to certain diets, uh, there are gluten eliminated from certain diets. Uh, if someone found that diet, if they wanted to experiment with a gluten-free diet, they could. Uh, the scientific evidence for that is limited. Uh, if you read Dr. Perlmutter's book, for example, Brain Grain, he tells you dairy is the cause of many illnesses. Um, so someone could do a trial of that. They could do a trial of, of one of those diets and eliminate gluten for a month. It's not easy, but uh, eliminate gluten for a month and see what happens. I don't think it should be universal that someone should eliminate gluten. Yes, eliminate dairy almost universally, gluten, trial and error. Right. One more question about, uh, well, two more questions on this, and then I'm going to move into the COVID stuff, all right? First one being, um, um, what do you think about food sensitivity tests? Are these reliable? In terms of MS, again, we have no consensus about a food or anything like that. I think if someone suspects they have an allergy, uh, there's no harm in doing it. The problem with many of those tests, I think, is that they, that they find so many different allergies. Uh, that it's hard scientifically. I've I had several patients, obviously, who've done these tests and bring me a list, and they have out, they're allergic to like 30 different things, and it's very hard to comply with all of that. And I find they often start out with these with these uh, programs, and after a, a month or two months, it's become so difficult that they uh, give up on it. I think the one allergy that I did quote earlier on is potentially a milk allergy, for example, as maybe the people with milk allergy. Maybe because the casein in milk, the, pro the protein in milk, milk protein casein may overlap with some proteins or some amino acids with, with myelin. We have a direct relationship there. And there may be other foods that have that relationship too. So I think if someone strongly suggests, strongly suspects they have an allergy to test for it, and if confirmed, to avoid it. But there's no universal allergy other than what I know with milk. There's no other universal allergies that I know of. Okay. Last question. The Beyond Burgers and Impossible Burgers are highly processed though they are plant-based. Are they good for people to eat or not good? Well, they're processed in the, in the sense of the way they make them. They have to go through special processes to make them. But when we talk about processed foods, we're talking about foods that have a large amount of preservatives and those and substances like that that, that render them uh, you know, of, of uh, less value health-wise. Plus the glucose inside them, for example, in the refined carbohydrates, lots of sugar, uh, and not, not that some vegetarian products don't have a lot of sugar, and this is also something. I say shop the label. Always look at the label. For example, yogurt. When you go and buy yogurt uh, in the store, such as I do, almond yogurt, if you get vanilla almond yogurt, it's got 15 grams of sugar. So I don't get that. I get sugar-free. It's got like one gram of sugar, and then I put my own taste in it. But what I do, I have it mixed with berries. You put a whole bunch of berries in it, and if you do want a sweetener, then use you know one packet of little one little packet of stevia to make it a little sweeter, rather than using the other sweeteners like aspartame and things like that. Sure, thank you. All right, thank you. Now let's move into the COVID stuff. More of the COVID. Keep going with the COVID. All right. First person asks: My husband came across an article in an Italian newspaper that claimed getting COVID booster would make my MS worse. Is there any, is there any validity to this that you know of? No. I uh, know there is none that I, uh, firstly, I never, amongst, we have MS chat groups where people like myself, you know, who care about our instant MS and do it all day long, write to each other and talk about things. And there's absolutely no evidence that uh, a booster makes MS worse. Um, there is no evidence at all. So there have been rumors in the past about a variety of vaccines that make MS worse, including like hepatitis vaccine and other vaccines, uh, all disproved over time. Uh, the MS Society uh, has published some small reports where they said that the vaccines or the booster did not make MS worse. 
of course, these are small studies. But, you know, we live in an age where things spread in a heartbeat. I mean, if something right. happens, you know about it 10 minutes later, uh, all over the place. I think if it was true that boosters were making people worse, we'd be reading this, you know, it would just be flooding the MS chat groups. And uh, you, you, you're you the expert on that, seeing what's coming from the chat groups. And do you see it? I don't see it. And I haven't heard about it, and my own patients have not complained about it. So I don't think it's, I don't believe that study. I'm not allowed to answer these questions, though. I'm not, I'm not the doctor, so I can't answer I'm these things. A, no, I'm asking you as a patient that reads chat group. <laughs> but I, I have understand never, you can't I have never, I have never seen anything to, um, to validate what this person's husband said, okay? Okay, next question. Can you explain how people with very high COVID antibodies, as proven through blood tests, still get COVID? Well, the, what the vaccine is meant to do, and look, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not an immunologist, nor am I an infectious disease specialist. I'm just like a regular neurologist. So, but COVID has intruded somewhat into our practice. So I just know it from that standpoint. But what, the, what does the vaccine do? So I hear some news channels, for example, talking about a certain person that got COVID and is a person that proposed that there is a person who says, take the vaccine, you must take the vaccine. And then that person got COVID and they're making fun of them and saying, huh, they took the vaccine and they still got COVID. Well, think about what COVID vaccine does. It works in our immune system and we have antibodies that are ready to attack the COVID. That's what it does. So you can still get COVID. The virus enters your body, it enters your mouth, it can enter your lungs. We, have, we don't have a shield around us. So the purpose of the vaccine, it does not stop us from getting COVID. But what it does do in the majority of people is prevent them from getting severe COVID. And we know that the death rate, the morbidity rate, the sickness rate, all of these things are much less after the vaccine. There's no doubt about that. There is just no doubt in all the studies. Some unfortunate people still do get very ill. And there is still some even mortality after people have had vaccines. But it's much less than people that have uh, taken the vaccine. Much less than people that haven't taken it than people who take it. Correct. You know, and many others even listening right now know, although there are others on here that don't know. Yes, I had COVID back in January. I had COVID after being vaccinated and boosted. And I am thankful, thankful that I was vaccinated and boosted because I have no idea what the hell would have happened or if I'd even be here today to even talk to you about this. I was still sick, but I could have been that much more sick. Could have been. I don't really know. I'm just saying that it probably would have been far worse if I had not been vaccinated and boosted. So um, I am thankful for that. As far as long-term COVID, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Yes, I am a recipient or I am a, a factor of long-term COVID. Um, there are many things that have affected me that had not affected others. I am part of a long-term COVID support group on Facebook. Okay, um, there is there, you know, we do communicate with each other. We do hear what's going on. Some people are, you know, some people were actually attacked by Delta and are long-term and are still feeling it. Others were, you know, had Omicron and lost it very quickly. I had Omicron and I'm still suffering from some of the things like a cough that is still here. I mean, daily I get this cough, raspiness, fluid buildup in my in my lungs or in my throat. Uh, my cognitive aspects have declined even further. It's not the MS that did this. I mean, yeah, it might be involved with the MS, but it did make it worse overall. And pain that I had not felt in years has reignited. So I've spoken with you about this doctor. I mean, Dr. Steingo is a doctor of mine. Uh, and um, I have spoken with him about this. I'm not telling him anything that I haven't spoken about in the past. But yes, I am thankful that I was vaccinated and boosted because, again, it could be far worse. So that ending, enough about my bitching about it. Let's go on to the next thing. And that is that, well, a person is asking, what long-term effects of COVID on patients do we know? Well, I just told you. Now we'll let the doctor respond. No, I, I think, um, you know, I listed all the symptoms and um, most of the symptoms are nonspecific symptoms. As you said, loss of taste, loss of smell, fatigue, breathing problems, shortness of breath, aches and pains, weakness. So there's some overlap with some of those symptoms with MS symptoms. Right. Uh, and we said right at the beginning, any time that someone gets an infection, 
uh, it can potentially trigger off an MS relapse. And COVID is no different. It's no different whether you get a urinary tract infection or a bronchitis, upper respiratory infection. Any of those can trigger off uh, uh, an MS relapse. And so COVID can do exactly the same. And any MS relapse can leave someone with residual symptoms. So if you've had COVID and uh, weeks later you're still feeling weak, this could be from a relapse if you've had a relapse. All we're saying about relapses is that they may occur, but we're not seeing COVID cause any excessive amount of relapses other than you would see with any other infection. It's not like that with COVID, everybody has a relapse or anything like that. It's that there may be infections, just like there could be after flu or upper respiratory or upper or urinary tract infections. Mm -hmm. And so some of the residual symptoms could be that someone did have a relapse. Correct. All right. And then um, I just wanted to bring up also that um, you were talking about things that have affected people uh, since the COVID. You spoke about this at the beginning of your presentation on COVID. And one of the things, though, that you had not mentioned, which I will address, is the mental wellness. All right. The, so psycho the, the psychological impact, the depression that it has caused many and many who are still not wanting to get back into the norm of life. I mean, uh, there are people that are terrified about going into a restaurant to eat or attending a support group meeting or attending a, a you know, an MS Views and News educational program or, um, or just getting out there and being with family and friends again. They are just terrified or those that were sheltering by themselves and <clears throat> got very, um, psychotic about this, I guess you could say, but these are people that are now lost in the system. And how do we address those issues? And what can you say about this? Well, I, I actually did list that um, in, in, in the slide that I showed about uh, COVID, uh, which, uh, which I labeled uh, the footprints of COVID. Right. Um, uh, which was actually written, uh, I took it from the internet. I got it from a Dr. Janetta. And um, she listed as the footprints of COVID. I think it was excellent. And the fourth footprint was, in fact, that. The okay. psychosocial stress, the effects. You know, just like we talk about MS, we talk about the symptoms of MS. Remember, we talked about the fact that the symptoms of MS lead to other problems. When you have MS and you fall and you break a bone or you get a urinary tract infection, ultimately you may lose a job. You may have, you know, household domestic problems, divorces, things like that in MS. That's the, the cascading sequence of events. And so the same thing happens with COVID because of all the problems with COVID. Down the road, you start to have many of these problems with mental health, uh, unemployment, financial stress, marital stress, all these things. And this is obviously a, a lot of this is written about with, because it's a big topic in our state and other areas of school kids, teenage kids, social relationships of kids, uh, kids go to college, not having establishing social relationships when they can, but also in populations with chronic diseases, people not being able to go out, not having support services. And, uh, you know, it's a huge society problem. It's something, you know, that uh, we try and help people as much as we can by, by support groups, by listening to programs like this, by joining support groups. Uh, you mentioned the support group on Facebook. Um, there is also a support group, the one that I, the support group that I had listed as well. I look to be a very good support group. So I think that's what people need, support groups, being able to, uh, you know, to speak to people. I actually, the other day, I just had a, a patient in my office like that uh, who is essentially uh, bed slash chair bound. Very uh, unfortunate for his situation. Uh, he's uh, in his 40s and now taken care of by his mother, who's in her 70s and just suffered from cancer. And it's tough. And it's tough for them to get around and have people to help them. But what I was able to do with him is link him to another patient of mine who runs a support group. And they've now uh, established some communication, at least by phone. And maybe it'll extend from there where he'll be where he'll be able to get out in the chair and have some transportation and go and sit with a group where people can talk to him and not be judgmental. Okay. Thank so you support for that. groups, I think, are very important. They are. They are indeed. So last question I have for you, and that comes from a person. This is similar to what we've been talking about. I've been working at home since the pandemic began. I'm nervous about returning to the office since my employer is not requiring mask wearing for any employee. Should I continue working at home as long as possible? Um, you know, everyone's different in our office. It's a medical office, although we don't see sick people. Most people that come to see a neurologist are not sick in the sense of coughs or colds or sneezing. They usually would stay home. 
but every one of us in our office wears a mask. And so I think if I go out somewhere, I put my mask on. Uh, so I think if this person, if, if you're allowed to stay at home, yeah, and you feel safe that way, by all means, stay home. Uh, if, it become, if it comes down to losing the job, I would say, uh, you know, put on a mask and go and do the job. And of course, we have the opposite thing as well. You have the person that goes to work and this mask is required and they don't want to wear a mask. And they get fired because they're not having a mask when they have to have a mask. So, right. you know, I think people need to all meet in the middle and compromise and allow people to do what's comfortable for them. If I put a mask on, it doesn't burden anybody else. It's the other way around. If they don't put a mask on, they threaten me and other people. So the person with a mask is the more considered one in general. If the other right. person wants to make a decision not to wear a mask, they're, they're taking a risk for themselves, though. But they also could be risking somebody else if they, you know, were exposed to COVID. That's the part I don't like is you're not only risking yourself. If you were purely risking yourself by not wearing a mask, I, okay, take the risk for yourself. But if you were just recently exposed to COVID, and you could, you could, you know, make someone else sick. I, I had said that that was the last question, but I actually have one more, right? So what is the reason, do you know of, um, why, is there any reason for why some people are not vaccinated um, they do get COVID. They're around other people. Some people um, can catch it from somebody else and others don't. How is that, you know, why is that happening? Why is it that some people could be right next to somebody that's got a highly context, uh, infectious Omicron or BA2 or BA1 and yet never get it? What's the reasoning, if any? I mean, you know, our immune systems are very, very different. I mean, have you not heard, I'm sure you have, of a young person or a person that seemed in relative good health? So when you heard of a person that was diabetic, uh, heart disease, overweight, they've got, they've, got a, they've got Delta and they passed away, we're not surprised. We know they had comorbidities and they were very sick and at high risk. However, at the same time, you hear of a 42-year-old man who was an active man who ran, who used to run and exercise, and he got, he got COVID and died. So our immune systems are very variable and you know each one of us has our own pattern of our immune system are very variable so that is some of the reasons why this happens is that uh, the virus will enter some people and rapidly infect them and make them sick and it will enter other people and their immune system will handle it very well it's just innate differences we have a part of our immune system the first line of defense it's called the innate immune system it fights anything and everything it's not specific like the second part of our immune system, which is adaptive. The first part is innate, and some of us just have a better innate immune system than others. In addition, as people age, the innate immune system is weaker, which is why with COVID we've seen that older populations do worse because they're innate, their intrinsic immune system is weaker. All right. Thank you, doctor. Thank you for being here. A, uh, okay, you know, you. another great talk. I appreciate it very much, and I'm sure that everybody online tonight did as well. I do want to say uh, thank you to our supporters again. We got Biogen, Genentech, and Santa Fe. And um, everybody, tune into our website. Check it out. And you'll see what programs we have coming up next. Okay? Thank you very much. Everybody have a great night. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.